I am showing that it is one o'clock Eastern time, 12 o'clock my time. I'm in uh, Austin, Texas. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. We've got about 45 minutes today. Uh, and today's topic is using Linux securely in the cloud. Uh, my name is Thomas Cameron. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a little while, but uh, I am a senior solutions architect uh, for Amazon Linux at Amazon Web Services. My contact information is in the slide deck. And uh, I, I, I encourage you to contact me if you have any questions about what we talk about today. I'm going to be moving pretty quickly because as you probably know, security in a cloud environment is a massive, massive topic. Uh, and with 45 minutes, I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface of a number of different components that make up your security uh, posture. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kill my camera just because I don't think you need to see my face. I think what's on the slides is probably um, a lot more important. So uh, as I said, uh, my contact information is on there. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is a little bit about my background, who am I, and you know why, it, why uh, I'm here. What is securing Linux in the context of cloud computing? You know, it's like the old commercial said, this isn't your father's uh, Linux. To, today, Linux usage in the cloud is pretty radically different from uh, what I grew up doing. We'll move into managing packets, package sets with an eye towards keeping the attack surface area as small as possible on your Linux instances in the cloud. We'll talk a little bit about service management. Uh, don't run what you brung in the, in the terms of old race car drivers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about service control and when to disable or uninstall services. I'll talk a little bit about firewalling because firewalling is a very, very important topic and firewalling has really changed a lot in the in the time that I've been dealing with Linux, uh, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about those changes and how we deal with them uh, in a few minutes. Logging is critically important as a component of your service, uh, your security posture. If you don't know what happened, you don't know how to fix it. And uh, almost all secrets are revealed through system logging. So it's important that you understand logging and how to deal with it. User management, you know, you need to understand who can do what and when and where and how and how to manage in your Linux environment in the cloud. We'll talk about, about patching or how dev and ops learned to hate each other. Uh, when, when to apply patching, what sorts of scheduling, uh, testing and things like that, that stuff's really important. And then I'll end up, because I have to talk about it, if anyone out there knows who I am, I've done uh, SE Linux talks for years at uh, Red Hat Summit and other events. So we'll talk a little bit about security enhanced Linux as well. So who am I? Well. You know, who am I? Why should you care? And maybe even should you care? <laughs> um, I'm Thomas Cameron. I started working with Linux back in 1995. I've been doing this for a very, very long time. I was actually working for Microsoft at the time. And one of my coworkers kept going on and on and on and on about this Linux thing and how cool this Linux thing was. And and I, uh, I, I told him, you know, I'm going to stand up a Windows NT351 server and I'm going to stand up a Linux machine side by side. And I'm going to prove to you you that Windows is the future. And here we are, you know, some 20 something years later, 25 years later. And uh, I, I've been a Linux guy for ever since. So I worked for Red Hat for almost 14 years. Um, and now I'm the senior solution architect for Amazon Linux at Amazon Web Services. So I'm definitely not the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, oh, I know all things and I am all seeing and all knowing. That's certainly not the case. But I've made enough mistakes to have learned a few things. I've got some pretty impressive scars. And hopefully <laughs> you can learn from my failures and not repeat them. <laughs> so as I said, this is not your dad's Linux. Um, securing Linux in the context of cloud is, is potentially fairly complex. There was a time when we looked at securing Linux as do something on one OS instance, and typically that OS instance was installed on bare metal. You know, it's a physical server with Linux installed directly on it. You know, figure out how to secure it one time and then scriptify it and, and repeat it in times. And if I had 10 or 20 or even a couple of hundred or maybe even a few thousand servers, um, that uh, kind of worked. 
but it doesn't work in cloud scale. When we talk about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of instances, um, especially when some of those instances are, are ephemeral and they're not going to be there for long enough for you to run big complex jobs against them, doing that doesn't really work at cloud scale. It also doesn't take into account that in cloud computing, you generally don't have a, a network team and a storage team and a security team and an OS team and so on. We are all sort of expected to understand. Oh, did we lose the uh, audio? Okay. Um, we can't, you know, we're all expected to understand the fundamentals of pretty much all of the components. Now, certainly we're still going to have people who are experts in security and we're going to have people who are experts in storage and things like that. My point isn't that you have to be a generalist and be able to deep dive in every single topic. It's that things are so much more complex today than they were even 10 years ago uh, that you need to understand the fundamentals, at least, of the uh, components. So uh, this is just a quick diagram I did um, of a very simple uh, LAMP stack. This is, this is just a very simple LAMP stack using um, a couple of Linux instances, MySQL, application services, and so on. And man, that's actually fairly complex if you look at it. You know, you can, you, you've got your database services, you've got networking services, you've got uh, multi-subnets potentially, you've got multiple availability zones. Now, I should be clear, most of my examples will be done using AWS just because I am more familiar with AWS than anything else. I will also talk about uh, Google. I will talk about Azure. I don't want to give the impression that I'm, I'm doing some marketing campaign for AWS. I'm trying to cover as much as I can. But for examples, um, I'm probably going to use AWS just because I know it better. But my point here is just setting up what used to be a pretty simple, you know, I would install the operating system, I would install uh, MySQL, I would install PHP or Perl or, you know, whatever, I would install Apache. Like, it's become a lot more complicated and we need to understand that complexity. So when we talk about securing your package sets, the goal here is to keep the attack surface area as small as possible. So keep your package sets small. Uh, and by that, I mean, if, if a service is not installed, it can't be attacked. Um, so if you don't have a networking, uh, a network facing service installed uh, that, that becomes vulnerable to a buffer overflow or, or something like that, then it can't be attacked. Um, so, if you don't have, for instance, compilers installed, it can't be used to build attack or exploit tools. There was a, a trend for a while there where, you know, we would install Linux operating systems and just install everything. Like, just give me everything and I'll figure out what I need to use. And bad guys exploited that by doing things like uploading a uh, tarballs or getting a, a shell through a poorly configured PHP config or something like that. Uh, and then they would download and compile tools to attack your kernel and, and get access to your system. But if there's no compiler installed, that stops them in their tracks. Um, and you really want to keep your system as lightweight as possible. Even consider that the default image, in my case at AWS, it's called an AMI, an a, uh, AWS machine image. But the default AMI build may be too heavy. You may have stuff installed on there that you don't need, and you need to consider paring down your package list so that um, it, uh, it's, it, it, you don't have anything that's there for bad guys to leverage. Use tools from your OS provider or your cloud provider to keep your system updated. Um, keep your package list small and then keep your systems up to date. Um, tools from your OS provider. Uh, if you are running Red Hat or CentOS or Fedora, um, you could use, for instance, the Red Hat Satellite Server version 6. That's a commercial offering, um, and it works for those distributions. Or you can use Catello, which is the community upstream version of S Satellite 6. works really, really well, but it does not come with commercial support. Or even Spacewalk, which is the community upstream to Satellite 5. All of these give you the option of doing things like doing bulk remove or add of uh, groups of applications or groups of, of packages. So you can go in and say, you know, uninstall the web server group or uninstall the NFS server group or whatever. So use those tools from your OS provider. Um, RUI, the Red Hat Update Infrastructure for Cloud Computing, 
it kind of helps with that. Ruby is really more of just a package repository. Um, so it doesn't provide the advanced capabilities that Satellite or Catello or Spacewalk do, uh, but it's out there and it's something that you can use as well. If you live in SUSE world, um, use SUSE Manager. SUSE Manager is, is based on uh, Satellite 5. Um, or Spacewalk, I should say. It's a community upstream for SUSE Manager. So you can use SUSE Manager or Spacewalk to do the same thing. Manage your OS instances and on a large scale, add or remove software groups or software packages so that you're minimizing that surface area of attack. Uh, Canonical has Landscape. You can use Landscape as well for doing the same thing. Uh, and then you've also got cross-platform tools. If you want to do things like Ansible or Chef or Puppet or Salt or, you know, there's a ton of tools out there that can be used to build a, uh, a management tool set or management platform. And you can go in and either run OS commands or, uh, or just manually give instructions for removing groups of packages, again, to keep that attack area surface as small as possible. Cloud providers have tools as well. Um, at AWS, we have the AWS System Manager. Uh, we can do things like Session Manager for doing uh, multiple logins, for instance, across multiple systems, Patch Manager uh, for, for making packages available, and State Manager for keeping systems at a specific state, like um, only these packages installed, uh, if anything other than these packages get installed, uninstalled it, uh, make sure that we are at exactly this version of package X and so on. So uh, so those are tools that are available from Amazon. Azure has the uh, Azure automation tooling, which provides similar services. Um, I'm not an expert in Azure. I dug around a little bit in doing this uh, presentation. Um, I, it seems like there are several tools that are available but uh, the one that seems to be the overarching suite is the uh, Azure automation. And then Google Cloud also has the uh, OS patch management suite of technologies. I dug around in their documentation. Same thing, I'm not really an expert there. My point is that you can manage your package sets a bunch of different ways. You can do it uh, using community operating or community open source tools, and that's perfectly fine. You can use commercial tools from your OS vendor. Um, you can use community tools uh, for, for package management and package group management. Uh, and then you can also use tools from your cloud providers. The main thing that I want you to take away from this is make sure that you understand what's installed on your systems and you remove the stuff you don't need. And if things get added, um, have a mechanism for removing them uh, proactively. Uh, so you need to be able to install, remove, and fix. And by fix, I mean set it at a specific point in time, uh, versions of packages on your instances. If somebody uh, inadvertently updates a persistent system, uh, and by persistent, I mean a system that's going to live for a long, long time rather than an ephemeral system where we just spin it up, do a job, and, and destroy it, um, you want to have a mechanism to downgrade packages to whatever your standard is. Remember that in many cases, we are doing Linux in the cloud to run commercial off-the-shelf off software where there are requirements that we're going to be at a specific patch level, uh, so make sure that you have a mechanism for downgrading or uh, reverting your systems to that patch level. If somebody installs something outside of your approved package manifest, you need a, a mechanism to remove it. And you may need to set up a dev and test and production type of life cycle where we you know, build something in dev, we test it in the test or QA environment, and then roll it out into production uh, as, as um, it passes all the QA testing. Uh, if you have a tool or tooling like Satellite or Systems Manager or something like that, um, that's going to help make that a lot easier. Um, just as we always talk about the least ne necessary privileges um, for running applications, we should also operate on the least necessary packages. If you don't have a good need to have a package suite or a group of packages installed, it probably makes sense to uninstall it. So that brings us to the next task, which is service management. Um, don't just trust that the machine image that you're using is secure by default. It's probably relatively secure, but don't just run what you brung. I come from a racing background. Sorry, I was a, an old old uh, motorcycle racer. And, um, you know, we always said just, just race what you brung or run what you brung. Um, but we want to make sure in today's security conscious cloud environment that on your Linux systems, as I mentioned earlier, unnecessary services shouldn't be installed at all. Now, if you have services that maybe aren't used often, 
but you do need to use them periodically, well, that's fine. At least disable them and then only start them as needed. Um, that's kind of a pain because, you know, the intimation there is that maybe you're going to be logging in remotely and turning things on and turning things off, which kind of flies in the face of what cloud is uh, is supposed to be. Um, but I'll, I'll address that in just a few minutes. <sighs> Be aware of what services start by default on your instances. If you don't need them, disable them or preferably uninstall them. But if it's something that you know you're going to use uh, periodically, then yeah, just at least disable them. For system D based distros like Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora and CentOS and Amazon Linux to SUSE, Debian, Ubuntu, and so on, you can just use system control. And so what I did was uh, I logged onto the machine and I, I just ran the command system control list unit files. And again, as Nancy was kind enough to say, if you want this screen to be a little bit bigger, click twice on it and it'll make the screen a little bit bigger in your uh, web interface. So you can see that the first thing I did was I ran list unit files. I just want to see what is turned on. And this will give me a list of all of the services or, or unit files that are managed by system control or system D. And you can see what their status is, whether they're enabled, whether they're um, statically enabled, so you can't change them, whether they're disabled and so on and so forth. And let's say that I scroll down and I see that the NFS server service is enabled on this instance. Um, <laughs> raise your hand if you think that having NFS enabled on an internet facing server <laughs> is a good idea. Uh, hopefully nobody's raising your hand. I hate that. This is the part that really stinks about doing this remotely is I can't see anybody's faces. But, uh, but my point is, let's say that we found a service that we realize, you know, we may need to use, we, we're, maybe we're going to use it for backups or, or I don't know what, maybe we want to keep the NFS server service installed, but we don't want it to be enabled. So what we can do is we can disable the NFS server by going in, and so the first thing that I do up here is I do system control status NFS server, and it comes in, it tells me a couple of things. It tells me that it is enabled by default, um, and I can see that it is actually active. So it's running right now, and that's fine. Um, I can then use system control to stop the NFS server service, and then I can use system control to disable the NFS server service, and then if I do system control status, now we see that it is disabled and it is, it's inactive and it's dead. So I have turned that off. I can still manually turn it on, but when the machine reboots, when this machine image reboots, it won't come on. Um, now, you should be able to do this through your systems management platform so you're not doing bespoke configs. Remember I said earlier, um, the challenge is we don't want to have, uh, you know, some horrible mechanism where you're doing, you know, for I and host one, host two, host three, host four, host five, do SSH, you know, don't do that, man. For I is not a, <laughs> is not a systems administration strategy. Don't do that. Use a tool. <laughs> um, so that's service control. Make sure that you know what your services do. Make sure that you've got the ones disabled that you don't need. If you're really positive, you're never going to need them. Make sure that they're disabled. Uh, so now let's talk about firewalling. Firewalling is a fairly arcane art. Um, I remember when I first started working on uh, Linux and I started working with the old IP chains utility, uh, trying to understand what, you know, what is a port and what is a protocol and how do all these numbers uh, relate to each other, um, it, it took me a while to sort of wrap my head around it. So I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit basic here. And forgive me for those of you who already understand this stuff, but I want to talk a little bit about some firewalling basics. You know, you'll hear me, folks, talking about ports. What is a port? A port is just a predefined number that's assigned to a service that that service listens on on the network. Um, you can think of these numbers similarly to how we think about addresses in postal mail. Um, and by that, I mean, if, if let's say my family lives at 123 Main Street, we've all got the same address, right? 123 Main Street. If a piece of mail comes to 123 Main Street, well, how do I know that it's going to me or my wife or my two daughters? Well, there's additional address information on the envelope. If I look at the envelope, it says it's addressed to me or it's addressed to my wife or my daughters or whatever. So 
you can think of a port number as sort of the same thing. Um, if web, DNS, and file and print services all run on one computer, they all share the same address, like 192.168.99.100. When a packet comes in, um, if it comes in for the web server, well, how does the system know which service receives the packet? Well, there's additional address information, and that is the port number of the service. The packet that comes in will say, I'm destined for 192.168.99.100, port 80. Services generally listen on predefined ports using predefined protocols. Uh, web services, for instance, are generally on 80 and 443, 80 for insecure, no SSL, and 443 for SSL or TLS or, or some other mechanism, and typically use TCP, for instance. DNS listens on 53 and typically uses UDP, although be careful because under um, heavy traffic conditions, um, DNS servers will also use TCP. Um, SSH, for instance, the SSH server listens on port 22 and it listens using TCP. Email transfer uses port 25 and uses TCP. There are hundreds of defined services. And if you go look in the file called slash Etsy slash services, you'll see what all of those services are, what are the predefined services are, and they are predefined um, and we share the that information in Etsy services and there is a registry of services so uh, that's that's going to be common across all the systems you use now it used to be that we'd leave firewall rules to network engineers or we would just use host-based firewalls for everything you know it used to just be that I would go tell the the Cisco person or the you know the whoever's running my network infrastructure, hey, I've got a web server and a mail server and a you know database server, and, and they would set all those firewall rules up for me. But today, we really need to be able to understand about firewalling and how they work and where we can apply firewall type services. And this is what I'm talking about. In, in my environment, in AWS, I can apply rules at the virtual private cloud level using network ACLs, at the EC2 level, which is the instance level, using security groups, and at the host level using IP tables, for instance. So we've got some options and you kind of have to understand how those options work so that you know, you know which one to choose. For instance, if I'm using network ACLs, I can define a network ACL and that's going to affect an entire subnet. So if I set a rule that says I want to allow inbound access to port 80 on using TCP, so web services, that's a blanket rule for the whole subnet. Every system that's on the subnet will have port 80 opened. So that may not be a bad thing. That may be perfectly fine, but just be aware that network ACLs affect entire subnets. EC2 security groups affect individual instances. So if you create a security group which allows access to port 80 and TCP, you'll then assign that security group to those instances you want folks to be able to access on port 80 TCP. And you can stack um, security groups, or you, yeah, let me rephrase that. You can create security groups that have multiple rules. Like I could say, I wanna open up 80 and 22 and 443. You know, I can, I can uh, set either multiple security groups or I can stack rules within a security group. Host-based firewall settings affect only that one instance. So if I'm using IP tables on an individual Linux instance, it's only gonna affect that one individual Linux instance. Now, network ACLs are stateless. Security groups are stateful. So security groups are going to be smarter in that, you know, if I've allowed traffic into, uh, you know, port uh, 443, for instance, the traffic that's then outbound um, that's in response to that request, it's going to, the, the, network, the security groups are going to be aware of that and understand that, oh, this is a response to that inbound request. Now, security groups only allow connections. The, de the default behavior for a security group is deny everything. So when you are setting up a security group, you're going to, you're going to, the, the last rule is going to be deny. So you're going to have to go in and say, I want to allow access to port 80, port 443, TCP on both of those, and so on. Uh, whereas network ACLs support both allow and deny rules for a protocol, for a subnet, for a host, and so on. Security groups are processed before network ACLs. And there are perfectly valid reasons to use network ACLs, security groups, and or host-based firewalls. It's going to fall down to comfort levels. It's going to fall down to um, what you're trying to accomplish. It's even going to fall down to, you know, what you're most comfortable with. I'm going to show you a, a screenshot here in a second that's actually 
silly. And I'm sorry, this is smaller than I had intended it to be, guys. I, I, I apologize. But I have um, set up a security group and I said, I'm going to allow all traffic, all protocols, all port ranges from everywhere into the systems that I associate the security group with. Now, in the real world, that's actually kind of crazy. You probably shouldn't do that. But if I'm an old Linux geek and I have been working with IP tables, you know, for 20 years, like me, um, then maybe that does make sense. Maybe that is a good thing to do because, um, you know, I, I, I am used to just having raw access to my systems. I log in and I set up my IP tables rules and then I replicate those across the machine. Maybe that makes sense. Probably not, but you know, maybe, maybe for us old gray beards, that makes sense. <laughs> Now, I do want to compare and contrast. This is a network ACL. Now, remember that network ACLs are going to be assigned to subnets. They're going to be associated with subnets. And let me go back to the, um, I'm sorry, let me go down. Um, so you can see that I've got inbound and outbound rules. And I've got, you know, again, I can I can be as granular as I want. I can do multiple um uh, protocols, multiple multiple port numbers, and so on and so forth. This is applied because it's a network ACL. This is applied to the subnet. If I go back over here to security groups, um, this is this is going to be applied to individual uh, instances. So that's kind of the difference there. Um, and there are similar setups for other clouds. My point is not that I, you know, hey, go use the AWS way of doing things. My point is understand that different clouds have different security mechanisms and they're going to, to give you access uh, to subnets and to hosts in different ways. Just make sure you understand them before you set up your network access rules. Make a decision uh, as to are you going to apply all your security at the subnet level or at the host level? Or are you going to do a combination of them uh, or you know, just, just make the decision and go from there? Now, I want to talk a little bit about logging because as I said earlier, uh, if you don't know what happened, you can't fix it. And the only way to really know what happened is to look at log files, look at what's going on from a logging perspective. But here's the thing, we're talking about cloud scale. Um, cloud scale can involve, I mean, seriously, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of instances. So, you know, things get really, really crazy when you talk about trying to manage logging at that kind of a scale. Uh, it is non-trivial, but you really have got to do it. Um, there are a ton of solutions available out there. Um, stuff as simple as Nagios to um, Elk Stack, which is Elasticsearch Logstash and Kibana, Kibana, which is super, super, super popular. The Elk Stack is really, really popular and very powerful. Uh, FluentD and a lot of other open source solutions, community-driven solutions, uh, some of which have commercial backing and some of which don't. There are also commercial offerings like Splunk and SolarWinds and AWS CloudWatch Logs and Azure Monitor and uh, Google Cloud Logging and so on. Those are all uh, really viable tools uh, and will allow you to do some things like look at trend analysis, look at, um, you know, hey, if somebody's trying to break in or, ooh, if I'm running into a consistent problem, you know, with some service. I've got a service running and, you know, I've noticed that after 21 days, the service becomes unstable. If you're doing log file analysis and you can spot those trends, you may be able to keep yourself from having downtime because, you know, you know, oh, hey, it's coming up to X number of days. You know, maybe I should recycle the service or, you know, reboot the instance or, or better uh, is reach out to the, the upstream and figure out why this thing's crashing out after 21 days. Um, but my point is you really need to understand what's going on in your environment. If you don't have good log file analysis, you're exposing yourself to risk and you're probably not going to know what's going on. And no, it is not good enough to just SSH into the instance after you've had a problem and start poking around. Uh, you really do need to figure out a way to aggregate your logs um, into a central location and do some sort of analysis of that, whether it's commercial stuff like CloudWatch logs, Azure Monitor, Google Cloud Logging, Splunk, SolarWinds, or something like the Elk Stack. Uh, user management. So whew, when we talk about user management, that has changed quite a bit as well. Um, it used to be that we just dealt with 
regular Linux users, right? The You'd use user add or user mod or user del, and they would be stored in Etsy password, Etsy shadow, Etsy group, and Etsy g shadow. Uh, they'd have a home directory under slash home, and, and we could you know change passwords and do all that kind of good stuff. And for a single system or even a handful of systems, yeah, that's doable. That's fine. Um, but as things scaled in, in the early days, we would look at things like directory services, like open LDAP, the 389 directory server, active directory, and things, uh, things of that nature. Um, you know, you do need to understand directory services uh, because you're probably going to be using those, especially as you get to really large scale environments. But then you also have the additional complexity of, okay, there's my user account that exists maybe in the directory, but then I've got a cloud user account that maybe, you know, when I log into my my control panel for whatever cloud vendor that I use, whether it's uh, AWS or Azure or Google or Rackspace or, you know, any, any one of a number of really good providers, um, there's that level of authentication and authorization that happens in the case of AWS uh, at the at, at IM, the IM level, the, the identity and access manager level. Um, and that's a whole set of permissions that can be used for not necessarily what you're doing within the Linux uh, instances, but because everything is so tightly connected these days and because everything is so integrated, in a lot of cases, uh, we need to have access to spin up additional resources, like especially if we're doing uh, scalable applications. Well, I need to have privileges to spin up additional Linux instances or maybe, you know, increase the size of my database or, you know, there's a ton of things. So make sure that you understand the the connection between your cloud, your, your cloud providers login and what privileges you have in your cloud environment and whether or not um, you are uh, whether your cloud account has any relevance to your Linux account. Um, Jack, good question. Uh, any pointers on the most important system logs? So if you're using new systems that have uh, journal control, um, then yes, I mean, you can you can use journal control to dump everything that the system does. Um, you're gonna wanna look at things like any sorts of networking logs, any sorts of uh, kernel logs, like if the kernel is reporting any kind of errors, if your applications are logging correctly, they should be talking to journal control or to the, the system journal, and you can actually uh, pull out information on an application by application standpoint uh, or basis. And then uh, even if they're not talking to journal, the system journal, they can also uh, write to var log messages or var log, uh, you know, application one, var log application two. Uh, so those are all uh, system logs that you're going to want to look at if the application that is running is the one that you have that instance built for. So there's there's a most of the stuff that you're going to find is either in var log messages or var log whatever the service name is, or if it's a journal control system, then you can just use journal control and then uh, pipe out or pull out those messages which are specific to the services that you're running. Okay. Uh, understand the differences in user manager and choose the tool which works best for your enterprise. If you don't have like really massive scale, something like open LDAP or 389 may be absolutely fine. That may be all you need. Um, if you're not using Windows, well, certainly uh, Active Directory doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but if you are scaling really, really large, then you want to look at you know large, large directory services capabilities, either commercially available from your cloud provider uh, or using community tools. And then again, understand the privileges that the cloud services require and make sure that you address them. So if you want somebody to be able to spin up additional resources, make sure that you're handling that account, that user account with your cloud provider, not necessarily inside of Linux. <laughs> Patching or how dev and ops learned to hate each other. You got to keep up with patching. You have to keep up with patching. It's invasive and it takes planning and it takes time. And it may, may potentially, depending on the application you're patching, uh, involve downtime or outages. I don't care. Do it. You really have got to keep up with your patching. Um, and if your devs build the applications right, it should only impact you minimally. Um, in a perfect world, if you're building a cloud scale application, you're going to have some sort of shared data source. You're going to have a loosely coupled application that if one node of the application goes away, 
it shouldn't interrupt the customer perception of application availability in a perfect world. That's assuming you've got, you know, your load balancer set up correctly and all those kinds of things. But my point is work with your developers. And that's, this is where dev and ops start to love each other again, work with your developers to explain to them what it is you need to do when you're taking an outage and have them build the application to do that. Monolithic COTS apps, they're a different story. They suck. They're always going to suck. It's going to be a pain because, um, you know, you've got to, um, in most cases, you've got to shut down the application. You've got to quiesce a database or, or whatever. And yes, it sucks, but you have to keep things up to date. According to ZDNet, one in three exploits are due to unpatched servers. One in three. So, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the one whose organization is on the front page of the New York Times. So do your patching. And then final topic is security enhanced Linux. Um, don't turn it off. I know it's a pain. I know that you have to learn about it. Um, Security Enhanced Linux or SE Linux is a mandatory access control system which uses an administrative policy which is fixed. What that means is Unlike discretionary access control systems where permissions are set by users, um, you know, I can do a chmod 777 slash home slash T Cameron, for instance. Um, and, you know, anything, anybody who wants to access my home directory at that point is going to be able to get in. Um, if I use SE Linux, though, I can have policies that say things like the web server process may or may not access users' home directories, or the root user can enable or disable SE Linux. So I can get super granular uh, on what I allow. And even if a user does something stupid like chmod777 slash home slash tcameron, when the Apache web server starts up and tries to access his home directory, if there's an SE Linux policy in place that blocks it, the web server will not have access to that home directory. So SE Linux is definitely a belt and suspenders type of approach to security, um, but it's absolutely worth doing. Um, really, if you want to learn more about SE Linux, you can look at uh, a video that I did, uh, Security Enhanced Linux for Mere Mortals. It's on YouTube. It's from Red Hat Summit uh, two years ago. Um, my SE Linux videos have been viewed something like 180,000 times. So I'm, I, I think that they're pretty good. Um, they tend to get referenced a lot. So if you want to understand a little bit more about security enhanced Linux, uh, go watch SE Linux for or security enhanced Linux for mere mortals. Um, it's worth the learning curve. Uh, if you watch the video, it's about an hour. Um, it's worth the learning curve and it can absolutely save your bacon in the event of somebody doing something like Maybe they get access to the Apache web server. There's a configuration error or something like that. They own the Apache web server, and then they try to access like Etsy Shadow. Um, it will it will still stop them from accessing it because the Etsy Shadow file doesn't have the right SE Linux context for the web server to access. So it's good stuff. So in conclusion, because this is supposed to be a 45 hour thing, and I wanted to leave a couple minutes for Q and A. Um, security in the cloud is a lot more than just what you do to the Linux OS, man. It, it really is a lot more complicated. We have to understand a lot more. Um, I can't teach you much in 45 minutes except, you know, the things that you need to pay attention to. Now you get to go and learn though, how to manage all of these facets of security. There's nothing... I hope anyway, there's nothing that I've talked to you about that's like, oh, it's some, you know, hidden arcane magic. That's not the point. The point is um, just that there are a lot of areas that you need to consider. There are a lot of things that you want to think about when you're designing what your Linux images are going to look like on the cloud. And you want to make sure that you are managing those things in a sane, uh, uh, a sane fashion so that um, you're making good choices or even better um, you've learned enough to where you can ask smart questions you know the the goal here is um, to really get you guys to the point where you know where to start if you haven't touched Linux security in the cloud in the past so thank you guys very much and oh goodness it's, feel free to reach out <laughs> if you have any questions feel free to reach too but uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions um i definitely enjoy this stuff i do not mind i know a lot of folks um you know don't want to to be bothered or whatever uh but man do not hesitate at all to reach out to me if you have any questions let me put my contact information up there again real quick uh let's go to 
slide one. That's my contact information. I'm tdcam at amazon.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Thomas D. Cameron, and you can reach me on LinkedIn at LinkedIn slash N slash Thomas Cameron. Uh, let's see now. We've got some questions in the chat. Any thought about System D's plan to create their own user management system? <laughs> You're throwing grenades there, Ethan. You know that, right? Um, <laughs> um, you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I've been doing this 25 years. I, I don't, nothing surprises me anymore. Nothing really upsets me anymore. Um, if, if the community determines that it makes sense for system D to manage the user management, uh, or to manage user accounts, you know, I can see some benefits in that. I can see where people would be really bummed because the whole, you know, one tool doing one thing really well uh, w would be a point of frustration. So I, I get both sides. Um, hopefully, and I'm sorry if my cat comes on the screen, he just decided that it was time to be fed. Uh, hopefully, um, <laughs> uh, if, if that does happen, it will be done in a fashion where we can... Um, we can uh, uh, adapt to it and move in a way that's not super disruptive to older versions. Um, let's see, search phrases. You know, honestly, um, Michael, Google search phrases to lead you to good websites to learn. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily use Google searches. I would probably actually look at the security guides for the distro you're using. Every distro has a good security guide out there. I don't care who it is. I'm not going to get into the whole this distro is better than that distro. Um, I have yet to find a security guide for any of the majors that are not that isn't really, really good. So look at that and then follow up with whatever cloud infrastructure you decide to work with. So if you're going to work with AWS, look at our security guides. If you go with Azure, use their security guides, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that would be good. Paul Maharg, it is outstanding to hear from you, sir. It has been entirely too long. Um, any particular Udemy or Linux Academy courses you would point us at? Um, so if you look at, it, it depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, if you look at for instance, you know, what the the most available, or let's see, what's the term I'm trying to use? Um, who's hiring the most, right? If you look at who's hiring the most, they're going to look for folks that have like Red Hat or Amazon certifications. Um, if uh, and, and also Ubuntu and also uh, SUSE, but probably not to as great an extent. Most corporate enterprise environments usually use Red Hat or CentOS or some derivative thereof. Um, so choose the course that you want to do based on what you know what type of environment you want to be in if you want to be in devops you know something like that maybe you'd look more towards the, the developer side if you want to be a systems engineer like you know uh, a site reliability engineer then maybe more towards the linux side of things all right and as nancy said don't forget to, during the breaks to go visit sponsor booths or network with other attendees um bob asks was using scientific linux should i switch to centos now scientific scientific linux is no longer uh yeah no longer for new versions unfortunately scientific linux uh has the things that they were doing have become, I think, a SIG on CentOS. Um, now, I am horribly biased. I'm going to tell you to look at Amazon Linux. If you're doing stuff in the cloud, um, we're an RPM-based distro, system-D-based distro, um, super fast, optimized for AWS. If you're using us, look at Amazon Linux. If not, um, absolutely, man. CentOS, the CentOS community is phenomenal. The guys who run, and gals, who run the um, the project are incredible. I worked with many of them. I know them personally. Um, so, you know, again, I'm not going to get into the whole, like, this distro is better than that one. Um, there's not a bad distro out there, honestly. I mean, there's some that are really rough, but you know what? That just means you got more to learn. Um, you, you know, when it breaks or goes sideways or goes pear-shaped, then that just gives you an opportunity to learn. So um, use what, uh, what makes sense for the environment you're going to be in. And shameless plug for Amazon Linux, since that's what I do. <laughs> well, folks, I believe we are out of time. Thank you very much. Very sincerely, thank you for coming. Um, I know that this is just such a challenging time with the pandemic. Um, I hope that all of you are healthy and safe and that your loved ones are healthy and safe. Um, go out, be good to each other, take care of your family and take care of your coworkers and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>